Okay, so this is the class in optimization for static and dynamic system. Has everyone received this course information sheet? Okay, so this class, uh, I've been teaching this class for last four years and this time I'm making some changes. So one of the things that people commented in some of the previous offerings of this course was that one final exam is a lot of work. So that's why I have divided this entire course as in the evaluation criteria for this entire course has uh, six homeworks, which is as was the case in the last year, one quiz that's on linear algebra and calculus, which is a prerequisite for this course. Because I realized that many people who do not have adequate background in linear algebra and calculus come and take this class and then they struggle in this class. So that's why I have to take a quiz this time. And then there are two midterms and one project. Uh, one of the things that you should uh, consider is you should consider doing the project in a topic which uh, where which is geared towards a company where you would want to work so for instance if you want to work on audio processing in the future you could take up an optimization problem or you could study an optimization problem in the context of audio processing or if you are doing civil engineering you could take up some optimization problem in the context of civil engineering uh, for the course project and that would be useful when you go and apply to companies for internships or full-time positions they would really want to know what have you done as far as optimization is concerned so it's really useful to pick the course topic strategically uh, the project topic strategically homework policy uh, you are free to take help of your fellow students in order to solve homework problems but you have to submit your own uh, your own answers uh, quiz 1 is on September 19th, midterm is on October 8th, uh, the second midterm is on November 28th and then there is no final exam uh, because people complained about the final exam being too, too much to take for this class so that's why there is no final exam this year and the project report would be due on December 5th which is the last day of the class. All homeworks are due in class so before the class starts you can just submit your homeworks here. Uh, you could also submit your homeworks on Carmen. Uh, so you go, you go to the assignments tab and submit your homework. You can scan as PDF, whatever homework, whatever your answer is, just scan it as a PDF and upload it there. And that would still be considered as a submission. So you can either submit in the class or online. You don't have to submit at both the places. You won't get twice the grade for submitting on both the places. Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to cover any proofs because this is a 5,000 level class, but I know a lot of PhD students are taking this class and you would want to know what the proofs of some of the results are. So I definitely will go through the outline of the proof uh, and hopefully you can, uh, you can uh, read this book, which is the course text. You can read this book to understand what exactly, how the theorems were proved or how the lemmas were proved or how the algorithms were shown to converge to the optimal point. So this is the course text, Nonlinear Optimization by Bertsikers. This is one of the most beautiful texts I've ever found on optimization. Uh, but of course the opinion varies, varies from professor to professor. Uh, so I highly recommend that if you are going to work in the field of optimization, you should have a copy of this book. Uh, but if you don't want to buy it, it's completely fine. Uh, all the lectures are going to be recorded so you will have access to whatever has been taught in the class offline uh, on YouTube. Uh, by offline I mean out of the class. Uh, you will have access to it through YouTube. Uh, so if you, and by the way, the last year's class has already been uploaded to YouTube. So if you don't want to come to the class and you just want to sit at home and take the entire course, feel free to do so. Okay, you don't have to come here. <laughs> You want to take the lectures at 12 o'clock in the night, you are absolutely free to do so. It's a free country. Uh, has everyone received the course information sheet in the back? Okay, got it. Okay, uh, so let me tell you a little bit about this course. This course is going to introduce optimization, the theory of optimization and in particular, what kind of algorithms are there to solve optimization problems? Now, this field is pretty old. It started uh, back in 1800s in the context of uh, dynamic control systems. 
uh, and also in the context of physics. And then later on, people studied. Uh, so later on, it got a huge kick during World War II. Okay, so World War II is a fascinating time, and many of you who have taken my course before knows that I'm extremely passionate about knowing what happened during World War II. Okay, so so at during World War II, people wanted to move troops around, move supplies around in an optimal fashion with minimum cost, minimum number of minimum amount of resources. And that's when the theory of optimization started getting developed by people who were working, people who were essentially mathematicians, but working on some of these uh, problems of maximizing the distribution of resources with minimum amount of cost and so on. And then later on, there was the space program in the US and in Russia and many other countries in the world. And there also the problem of optimization cropped up because you wanted to send a spaceship all the way to the space but you wanted to consume as little fuel as possible because 99, 95% of the mass of a rocket is in the fuel. Okay, Only the 5% is the rest of the structure and satellite and whatnot. So, so the World War II and space race and then a lot of data started coming in and people wanted to optimize uh, and then computers were available so people wanted to do a lot of data analysis and then again that gave a strong boost to optimization. Now, in today's world, machine learning and artificial intelligence has become famous for some reason, and that again has given a strong boost to optimization, to optimization as a field. And so, no matter which conference you go to, uh, in controls or in uh, energy systems or in power systems or in um, machine learning or in artificial intelligence, optimization algorithms will come up again and again. Okay, so that's why this course is very foundational very important and very theoretical. Um, okay, so uh, be willing to struggle a little bit in this course, okay, because this is uh, going to introduce optimization from a mathematical viewpoint, from a linear algebra viewpoint. It will require you to imagine how things work in n dimensions where n is greater than or equal to 3. So, so far you have you're able to plot functions, you're able to plot differential solutions to differential equations, um, and you're able to visualize what's happening for whatever system you're looking into. But in optimization, that's not the case, and that's why you need to have some level of abstract thinking, and some way to generalize what you see in R3 or R2 can be generalized to higher dimensional spaces as well. Okay, so those are some of the things that you will develop as part of this course. Okay, so that was a brief history of optimization and what is expected out of you. You have any questions on this? Okay, now I'm going to teach this course using the latest technology that's available, which is board, whiteboard, and pens. Okay, so there are no PDFs, no lecture notes, nothing. Oh, and of course, videos are available, but no lecture notes, no PDFs, no presentations, no PowerPoints, no nothing, okay? So don't ask for it <laughs> later on uh, that, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing is, I've been teaching courses for a very long time, but people write in SEI, Student Evaluation of Instruction, that, oh, the lecture notes were not provided. So I just want to make sure everyone knows lecture notes will not be provided. If you cannot take a course without lecture notes, please don't take this course. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so save yourself some uh, some time and uh, go and take other courses where lecture notes are provided. Okay, but videos are provided. Okay, videos will be uploaded on YouTube. Uh, you can you can watch those videos as many times as you like. Okay. So the way we are going to start is. Um, covering some of the material that you might have forgotten. Uh, so I'm going to cover some topics from linear algebra and calculus and convex functions and convex sets. So today's lecture and Friday's lecture will be devoted to covering some of the prerequisites that many of you may already know, many of you may have forgotten, so I just want to bring everyone on board uh, with some of the basic things we are going to use again and again in this course. So the first topic is vectors. So x 
in Rn. So what do we know about vectors? Uh, you can add two vectors, so x1 plus x2 is allowed. Uh, x1 minus x2 is also allowed. So let me give you an example, 2, 3, 4, 5, then x1 plus x2 is 6 and 8. Now you cannot multiply two vectors. So for scalars, you can certainly multiply it. It's a field. But vectors, you cannot multiply. But what you can do is inner product. So x1 dot x2. It's also called a dot product. So x1 dot x2 is x1 transpose x2, which is 2, 3, 4, 5, 8 plus 15, 23. Now two vectors are called orthogonal. So x1 is orthogonal to x2 if and only if x1 transpose x2 is equal to 0. I want to introduce a p norm. So we denote the p norm of x as norm of x with a subscript p. And this is square root of, no, not square root, p root of x1, p, x2. Uh, and I want to make sure that you know what x looks like. So this is not the same x1 as this x1. Yeah? Is that called the p-norm because it's used to normalize the vector? Uh, what do you mean normalize the vector? As in if you wanted to create a unit vector, that point in the direction of whatever it was? Yes. Yes. So. If you want, so unit vector is very much dependent on the norm, okay? So in two norm, a unit vector is on the surface of, okay, let me, so you are right in saying that if you define y as x over p norm of x, then the p norm of y is actually equal to one, okay? But, uh, but it, so, P is in 1 to infinity. Actually, infinity can be included. So if you want to look at what a unit vectors in norm 1 looks like, so that looks like this. These are the unit vectors in R2. So each of these vectors are unit vectors uh, in L1 norm. Okay, in two norm, which is what most of you would be familiar with, these are all unit vectors. So this is R2 with two norm. Okay, and the infinity norm these are all unit vectors. Okay, so unit vectors actually depend on which norm you are taking. So it's not invariant, norm invariant. Does that make sense? Where is the eraser? There are none. Okay. Can I find something here?
Okay. Uh, let me be back in a minute. I'll get some papers, tissue papers, so as to erase the board. Okay, any questions so far? If we treat the norm as an operator, is there an inequality between uh, norms of different keys? Yes. Do you want to know what those inequalities look like? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, this is not true, f okay, this is true for all Euclidean spaces. All norms are what is known as equivalent in some sense. Uh, what that means is XP so for every p, q in one infinity, there exist d, p, q, and d, q, p, such that x, p is less than or equal to d, p, q, x, q, and x, q is less than or equal to d, q, p, x, p. Okay, and these coefficients depend both on p and q. Uh, and they can be greater than one or less than one. Okay, and this is true for every, this is true, and they also depend on dimension n, actually. The dimension from, uh, in which your x lies in. Okay, so these, this is known as all norms are equivalent. Uh, what do I mean by equivalent? Well, if you are, let me get to sequences and then I'll, I'll, I'll get, come back to this position. What does it mean for two norms to be equivalent? Okay, so when we talk about convergence of sequences, that's where this equivalence will kick in uh, later on. So, Next, I want to talk about subspace. So I have a set X, which is a subset of Rn. Then X is subspace. If and only if X1, comma, X2 lies in X, implies AX1 plus bx2 also lies in x for all a, b in r. Okay, so a and b can take negative values as well. So what does a subspace look like? Well, I can pick x1 and x1, and I can pick a equals 1 and b equals minus 1, so that means 0 must lie in a subspace. So a subspace is essentially looks like a hyperplane which contains the origin, okay? And, and you could have vectors going in all directions. So in fact, a line passing through origin is a subspace. A hyperplane, a two-dimensional plane is a subspace. Or um, you could have in a three-dimensional pla plane, uh, you would have a subspace which is like a slanted hyperplane. Okay, but it has to pass through the origin. So a subspace passes, always passes through an origin. If you move it away, let's say you translate this subspace, so it's not, origin doesn't, origin is not part of the, part of the set anymore, then it's called a linear manifold. Okay, how many of you have heard the term linear manifold before? No one? 
Okay, so it's called a linear manifold or a linear variety uh, if you move the subspace uh, up and down. You translate it, then it's a linear variety. Next topic is linear dependence. Linear okay. dependence x1 to xn in Rm are linearly dependent if and only if there exists a1 to an not all zero such that a1 x1 plus a n x n is equal to zero. So linear dependence is a very important property. Uh, what that means is, so so let's let's look at the mathematical definition. And then I will go over a figure. So what this is saying is that a set of vectors are linearly dependent if there exist scalars a1 to an. Not all of them are simultaneously zero. Okay, so some of them have to be non-zero. But not all of them have to be non-zero. Yeah. So, so then, if you take the scalar sum, sorry, the 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 vector sum of a1 x1 all the way up to a n x n, then it leads to a zero vector. So typically, if this is the hyperplane, you have vector one, you have vector two, so. Naturally, these two are not linearly, uh, th so they are linearly independent because uh, because you cannot get one vector as a scalar multiple of the other vector. Uh, but if you put a third vector here, then suddenly these three vectors are linearly dependent. Okay, so this is your x1, x2, x3. So if you just look at x1 and x2, they are linearly independent if you look at x1 x3 they are linearly independent but if you look at x1 x2 x3 they are linearly dependent okay so you can you can find a1 and a2 such that what does this mean uh, can find a1 and a2 in r such that a1 x1 plus a2 x2 minus x3 is equal to 0. Okay? Or alternatively, x3 equals a1 x1 plus a2 x2. Okay? So if a set has, if you if you are given a set of vectors and they all lie in a plane, so you are given a set of vectors in a high dimensional space but they all seem to lie in a plane, then it means that they are linearly dependent. Okay, And it has quite a lot of applications in machine learning because many a times our choices and preferences of we as collective, collectively our choices and preferences typically lie in a lower dimensional space 
in comparison to the number of options. So to give you an example, all of you may have watched Netflix or Amazon Prime videos or whatever, right? So you all like some movies, okay? You give eight star to some movie, five star to some movies and so on, right? And you have, let's say one billion people on the planet have watched these online streaming websites. So you have this one billion uh, preferences, right? So you have a vector. Each vector says, how do you rate all these movies, right? And then, so that's, there's one vector for you, there's one vector for you, there's one vector for you, right? So you have 1,000 movies, right? So each person's preferences lie in 1,000 dimensional space. But if you look at the information of everyone in the room or everyone in the world, right? You look at these vectors, these vectors actually lie in a lower dimensional space. Okay, and that lower dimensional space could be 50 dimensional, could be 25 dimensional, could be 100 dimensional, but not 1000 dimensional, even though there are a 1000 movies and each person's preferences lie in a 1000 dimensional space. Okay, so this idea of linear dependence has become extremely important nowadays, particularly when you want to reduce the amount of data you have uh, in your data set. I'm going to use information from, or, or rather examples from multiple fields. Uh, so if you don't know about that field, don't worry about it, okay? I'm sure you will find some application in the field of your own interest, okay? I just may not be aware about it. Any question on linear dependence? Okay, let me now talk about range space. So I have a matrix A in R M cross N. So A has M rows, A has M rows and N columns. Yes. What space is this? What? What space is this? This one? Yeah, you, you said we're talking about this space of uh, that. You're talking about the example or this matrix? Oh, I am talking, I am going to talk about range space, oh, sorry, range space, okay, so range space of a matrix, so I pick a matrix A, which is, which has M rows and N columns, and I define R of A as a set of vector Y such that there exist X in Rn. This Y is in Rm. There exist X in Rn such that AX is equal to Y. This is also the space spanned by columns of matrix A. Okay. Yes. Uh, so you, I cannot call it a solution space. Okay. So, you, so you know about the domain and range of a function, right? So all this is saying is this is the range of a matrix, right? So, yeah. Okay. The second concept is null space of matrix A. So I am going to denote it by N of A, which is the set of X's that AX is equal to 0.
So null space sits in R R N and range space sits in R M. it is not very hard to show that range space and null space both of them are subspaces okay uh, next topic is rank of a matrix so rank of a equals to number of linearly independent rows which also happens to be number of linearly independent columns okay so rank is a fixed number and rank of a is always less than equal to minimum of the number of rows or the number of columns Okay. How many of you are familiar with rank of a matrix? Okay, some of you. Okay, so this is a very fundamental property of a matrix. Uh, if your so if rank of A is equal to min of m comma n, then a is said to be full rank matrix. Okay. So, so, so rank has become a very important concept in the context of uh, machine learning and dimensionality reduction in, within machine learning. Uh, I'll give you an example. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, this is a full rank matrix. Okay. Uh, how would you prove that, or how would you check whether this matrix is full rank or not? Any ideas? Sorry. If if what is three? I didn't understand. Oh, I see. Okay. So you will check the eigenvalues of this matrix? Okay, let me give you a different matrix then. Okay, now how will you check that this is a full rank matrix? I'm just gonna look and see if uh, 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 columns or rows are linearly independent. And, and, and but how will you check that? You do by inspection. Well, you could have a matrix which has a thousand rows and right. one million column. Yeah. Would you? I think you would take the reduced per echelon form and see which ones have pivots. Right. And those that have like, similar pivots and other yeah. columns. Yeah. Those. Yeah. So you can do Gaussian elimination, which has n cube complexity. You can do Gaussian elimination to check whether uh, this set of rows are linearly independent or set of columns are linearly independent or not. Okay, there was one hand in the back. Yeah, okay, that was the same answer as is. Okay. 
uh, yeah, so you can do Gaussian elimination. The other way to, so if you have a square matrix, the way to check whether it's a full rank or not, just take the determinant of the square matrix. And if it is non-zero, then you know that it's a full rank matrix. If it is, if the determinant is equal to zero, then you can't say much about what the rank, you, you can say that the rank is lower than the, the, the dimension of the matrix A, but you can't, you can't quite say how, how much lower, okay? So for that, you need to look at the eigenvalues of the matrix. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, let's move on to the next topic, which is uh, calculus. So I'm going to talk about multivariate calculus and a little bit about sequences and series. So let's say your xk is a sequence, okay? Now, you could take a sequence, let's say in Rn, okay? So most of you might have studied sequences in one dimension, right? So xk could be one over k, xk could be sine of k pi, xk could be cos of k pi and so on, right? So you might have studied sequences of this type, which is sequences in R, okay? But you can also consider sequences in Rn. Uh, so, I could have xk, which is one over k sine pi k and cos k pi, okay, so this is a sequence in R3. So one of the important things about the sequences is you want to study what happens when k goes to infinity, okay? So as you, you, you look at x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on, Right? And you want to understand how does the sequence behave as k goes to infinity. So let's look at the first sequence, 1 over k. So 1 over k would look something like this. Okay, it's a decreasing sequence. This is k equals 1, k equals 2, k equals 3, and so on. That's one over k, and now I want to plot. Can someone tell me what sine of k pi is for k in n? Any thoughts, guesses? Yeah. One? Okay, it varies. What is sine of? Okay, this is invisible ink. Uh, what is sine of zero? So k equals zero. Zero. What is sine of pi? One, two, five, ten. <laughs> zero. What is sine of two pi? Zero, and so on. Okay. So sine of k pi is actually zero. This is sine of k pi. 0, 0, 0, okay. What about cos of k pi? Sorry? 1 or minus 1, okay. So cos of 0 is 1. I uh, have to use a different color.
this is cos of 0 and then cos of pi and then cos of 2 pi and then cos of 4 pi and so on. Okay, so, so what we are seeing is that there is a sequence that's going down and converges to 0. It goes towards 0 as k goes to infinity. There is this other sequence which is constant and it's equal to 0. So it converges to 0. And then there is this, this sequence, cos of k pi, which seems to be oscillating. It doesn't really go anywhere. Okay, so, so what we have encountered is a situation where so this is the notion of convergence okay convergence so let's say you are in 17th century not 17th 18th century okay and you want to formalize this notion so you you have observed this okay you have observed this 1 over k goes to 0 this is always 0 and this one doesn't seem to go anywhere it's just oscillating okay how would you come up with a mathematical definition for convergence how do you say that a sequence converges okay so here is the definition that has been established over the past two centuries so xk converges to x star if and only if for every epsilon greater than zero there exist n dependent on epsilon in the space of natural numbers such that the norm of xk minus x star now this could be any norm okay so i'm not writing which norm it is it could be one norm it could be two norm it could be infinity norm xk minus x star is less than epsilon for every k greater than equal to n epsilon okay so this is the definition of convergence a rigorous mathematical definition of convergence okay let's apply it to this 1 over k problem So what I want you to think is what should be the value of n epsilon if my sequence is xk equals 1 over k. Yes. What is n epsilon? So n epsilon is a natural number which depends on epsilon that you have picked okay so for every epsilon greater than zero so which means you have i give you an epsilon i provide you with an epsilon you have to tell me an n epsilon a uh, natural number n which could depend on epsilon such that this inequality holds for every k greater than or equal to n epsilon okay so let me let me use this definition to show that this thing converges to zero Okay, so I claim that xk equals 1 over k converges to 0. Okay, so what do I need to show? Uh, I need to find an n epsilon. So let me guess. n epsilon could be 1 over epsilon. Ceiling of 1 over epsilon. So this is a C E I L ceiling function so if I pick this n epsilon then what do I have xk minus x star equals 1 over k minus 0 equals 1 over k uh, now I know that k is greater than equal to n epsilon so I get this is 
less than or equal to 1 over n epsilon. And this is less than 1 over 1 over epsilon plus some rho. Because you are using a ceiling function, rho is greater than or equal to 0. And this is less than epsilon. Okay? Or less than or equal to epsilon. So what did I do? I have a sequence. I want to show that the sequence converges to 0. So what I have to do is given an epsilon greater than 0, I have to come up with a natural number n epsilon. So this is a natural number such that xk minus x star is less than epsilon for every k greater than or equal to n epsilon. This is true for every k greater than or equal to n epsilon. This is this definition is trivially true in the case of xk equals to sine of k pi. But then you cannot apply it here because the sequence doesn't actually converge. Okay. Now, you're not going to pass through de this definition all the time in the course, but it's good to know what actually it means for something to converge, for a sequence to converge. Now, you're running an algorithm and you might have heard someone telling you, oh, my algorithm blew up. Okay, I'm getting not a number or I'm getting infinity after running my algorithm. What does that mean? Okay, that means your algorithm didn't converge to a point x star that you want it to, to converge to. There is a, an, a, the corresponding notion of divergence divergence which means xk goes to infinity. So when you're writing a paper or writing a scientific article or writing an answer to questions for this assignment, you don't really say that xk converges to infinity. Okay, you say xk diverges to infinity or xk converges to x star, which is x star has to be a point in the space. It cannot be infinity. Any question? Yes. If 1 over epsilon is 5, yes. But it has to be true for every epsilon greater than 0. So of course you could take epsilon equals 5, then you will take epsilon equals 1, then you will take epsilon equals 0 0.1, and then 0 0.01, and then so on, right? What I mean is that um, it is possible that epsilon is equal to epsilon, 1 over epsilon, right? Oh, yeah. well, yes. Uh, Typically, when I say epsilon greater than zero, not when I say, but when people say epsilon greater than zero, they are assuming epsilon is a small number. So you can't take epsilon to be 500, for instance. But even, even if you take epsilon to be 500, your n epsilon is actually well defined. It's equal to one, right? So there's no problem with taking epsilon being very large number, okay? It's just that people don't mean epsilon to be a large number when they are calling epsilon. And by the way, this is ECE course. So in ECE, epsilon is always a small number. Delta is always a small number. OK, so, don't, so, so when I say epsilon or when I say delta, I just imagine 10 raised to minus 6 or something. OK. Now there is a very specific class of sequences called Cauchy sequence. Cauchy sequence, okay? And this is something that you may not have studied. So I'm gonna spend some time on, on this. So I told you when does a sequence converge. Now I'm gonna tell you what is a Cauchy sequence. So this is a definition. Xk, k in n is a 
Cauchy sequence if and only if for every epsilon greater than 0 there exists an epsilon in n such that xk minus xn norm is less than epsilon for every k comma n greater than equal to n epsilon. Okay, so what does Cauchy sequence say? I am going to look at, so this would be my n epsilon. So I pick an epsilon greater than 0. Somebody magically gave me an n epsilon, okay. And now I am going to look at the difference between any two points in the tail of the sequence. So this is called the tail of the sequence and I'm going to pick two points okay so uh, two points so I'm going to look at any two points in the tail of the sequence and I take the difference between the two so what's the difference this is the difference between these two points and given epsilon greater than zero I look at any two points in the tail, I take their difference or I take the norm in, of the difference, it should always be less than epsilon, okay, for every k n greater than or equal to n epsilon. Okay, so that's the concept of or the definition of Cauchy sequence. So if you look at sine, I take any two points in the tail, I, differ, I take the difference, it's equal to zero, zero is always less than epsilon. So this is a Cauchy sequence. I look at 1 over k, right? Uh, I pick n epsilon equals 1 over epsilon, uh, ceiling of 1 over epsilon. And you can check that 1 over k minus 1 over n, absolute value is actually less than 1 over k, which of course is less than epsilon as we showed here. Okay, I'm assuming that k is less than n without loss of generality. Okay, so 1 over k is also a Cauchy sequence because the difference, as you move the tail, the difference between any two points in the tail is actually going to zero. It's becoming arbitrarily small. So that's a Cauchy sequence. Cos of k pi on the other hand is not a Cauchy sequence. Okay, because no matter where you truncate and look at the rest of the sequence, look at the tail of the sequence, the maximum difference between any two points is always going to be equal to 2. So you can't have epsilon going to 0 in the case of cos of k pi. So cos of k pi minus cos of n pi is always equal to 2. Not always, but you can always pick k and n appropriately so that it's equal to 2. So that's always greater than epsilon. And therefore, it's not a Cauchy sequence. So not a Cauchy sequence. Now, why do we worry about Cauchy sequence, especially in an optimization algorithms class? Well. Many of you will be running optimization algorithm and what you will notice is you look at the successive iterates, so you get, you run the algorithm, you get x1, then you get x2, then you get x3, then you get x4, right? How do you know that it converged? 
to a solution. How do you know that you should truncate at x 500 and not go all the way to x 1 million? So what you do is you look at the successive, the difference between the successive iterates. You look at x k plus 1 minus x k, then you look at x k plus 2 minus x k plus 1 and so on. And as you see that it becomes smaller and smaller, you say that, okay, fine, I think my algorithm is converged. This is the final answer. Okay, so you can never actually run the algorithm for infinite amount of time because we don't have infinite amount of time. You guys have to graduate probably five, six months later or whatever, two years later. Okay, that's not infinite. And so you can't be running an algorithm for infinite amount of time and you need to be able to argue that once you have truncated the algorithm or once you have truncated your, uh, once you have uh, uh, terminated your code, you are close to the optimal solution. And the way to say that is invoke the fact that it's a Cauchy sequence, okay? Uh, it is a well-known fact and we cannot prove it, but it's a well-known fact uh, in real analysis that in Rn, a Cauchy sequence always converges. So as long as you can satisfy this property, you know that your algorithm will eventually converge to the optimal point. When you're saying we can't prove it, do you mean we're not going to show the proof in this class? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. And not uh, the proof does not exist. But we oh no 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 no. Then it, then it's a conjecture. Then it's not a theorem. If if there is no proof, then it's a conjecture. It's not a theorem. No, it's, it's a simple proof, but we won't spend time on proving things in this class. Okay, so I'm just going to throw a lot of definitions and stuff uh, on you, uh, hoping that whenever you get a chance, you will learn the proof on your own. Okay, so Cauchy sequence always converges in Rn. Now, uh, just I just want to take one more minute. The final point that I wanted to make was when I say that two norms are equivalent, and that was the question asked by him uh, a few minutes ago, what it means is no matter which norm you take, if a sequence converges in one norm, then it also converges in two norm, it also converges in three norm, it also converges in infinity norm. Okay, so that's what it means for two norms to be equivalent. Convergence in one norm implies convergence in the other norm, then two norms are equivalent. Okay, that's all. Uh, we'll talk about. Uh, we'll continue our discussion on these topics next in the well, next class. Result holds for Euclidean spaces, right, and LP norms.